The Great Western Trail is a European-style board game, or Euro game, about cowboys driving herds of cattle north from Texas to Kansas City. Each player plays the head of a cattle company who will drive multiple groups of cattle to Kansas City over the course of the game. The two central mechanisms of the game are light deck building and a rondelle. A rondelle is a somewhat uncommon mechanic where players move pieces along a one-way track of actions. Typically, they have a limited choice of how many spaces they move, and they have to wait until their pawn comes around again to take the same action another time. Believe it or not, the trail on the board is a rondelle. It doesn't look like a circle, but once you drop your cattle off in Kansas City, your cowboy drops back to the beginning of the trail again in Texas, completing the loop. The manual says that players tend to complete this loop five to seven times each in most games. Deck building is a much more common mechanic, where players start with a small, unoptimized deck of cards, then use those cards over the course of the game to add better cards to their deck. In Great Western Trail, the deck represents your herd of cattle. At the end of the game, the player with the most victory points is the winner. There is no victory point track on the board, instead players will be adding up the claimed victory points indicated on the board player boards, buildings, hazards, and cards with this shield symbol. Station master tiles, which can be collected from the rail line, can add additional sources of points for players who claim them. At the end of the game, money is counted at a ratio of one point per five dollars, so it's usually better to invest it than hold on to it. It's common for Euro games to take place over a set number of rounds. However, Great Western Trail instead lasts a set number of trips to Kansas City. Thus, its length can vary according to the strategies the players employ. It is possible for players to rush the end of the game by taking fewer actions on their path to get to Kansas City faster. The end of the game is actually triggered when a player's trip to Kansas City fills up the last few spots of the job market and pushes the job market token off the end of the board. At this point, that player gets the token, which itself is worth two points, and every other player gets one additional turn before the game ends. Great Western Trail is played with a center board, cards, individual player boards, wood pieces, and a whole bunch of cardboard tokens representing money, buildings along the trail, and employees of your cattle company. Let's look at the board first. Great Western Trails board can be separated into five sections. Most of the board is taken up with the trail, a branching path of action spaces that will develop hazards and additional buildings over the course of the game. The rail line runs along the top and right side of the board. The employee market, or job market, runs down the left side of the board, displaying employees available for hire at any given time. It also acts as a timer for the game. The cattle market runs along the bottom of the board. The cattle cards are actually placed under the board, but the pricing information is on the bottom. In the upper left corner of the board is Kansas City. Each time a player gets their herd to Kansas City, they sell all the cards in their hand, add to the employee market and trail hazards, then ship their cattle to a train station along the rail line. They then return their cowboy to the bottom of the trail to drive another herd north. This is an example of one of the four player boards in the game. They are all functionally identical. Each player board can be separated into three sections. On the left side and top are the auxiliary actions, movement speed, and hand size indicators. Most of these start the game covered with wooden discs, limiting a player's options. As players make cattle deliveries, they will move discs from these spots to the rail line, increasing their hand size making their actions more effective, or unlocking new actions altogether. On the bottom right is the certificate track. The cube on the track moves as you get certificates, which can then be spent as currency to increase the value of your herd while delivering it to Kansas City. At the beginning of the game, the maximum number of certificates you can hold at a time is three. However, by making cattle shipments during the game, you can increase that to four and then six. In the center of the player boards are your employee slots. Each row houses a different type of employee. Cowboys increase your ability to purchase better cattle while reducing their cost. 
Craftsmen allow you to build more and better buildings along the trail. Engineers increase your ability to move your engine along the rail line. In addition to improving your actions just for having them, each employee row has slots that allow you to take bonus actions as you fill them. Note that the engineer row has a lot more of these bonus actions to balance out the effectiveness of the engineer. The other spot of note is right here up at the top, which tells you the cost of moving past different hazards that can occur along the trail, as well as your movement speed. The board is printed with the numbers for a two-player game, but you can cover them up with a cardboard chit with different numbers for three and four player games. There are two types of cards in Great Western Trail, cattle cards and objective cards. Cattle cards each show a breed of cattle and that breed's level or numerical value. Each breed of cattle has its own color. You can think of breeds as suits. All cards in the same breed are the same number, but not all cards of the same number are the same breed. The card's numerical value controls how much it's worth when sold in Kansas City, and also how much the card costs to buy from the cattle market. Objective cards each present conditions that must be met at the end of the game, and in the bottom right of the card, the bonus points it's worth at the end of the game if completed. Each player gets a simpler starting objective card that starts in play. Cards from the objective deck collected during the game have a bonus action in the upper left corner and are worth positive points if completed, but negative points if not completed. When you take an objective card during the game, it is added to your deck's discard pile. When it comes into your hand later, you can play it before or after taking the other actions in your turn for its bonus action. However, once you do that, it comes out of your deck to the tableau and must be counted at the end of the game. Objective cards purchased during the game, but not played for their bonus action, can be counted or not counted at the end of the game depending on each player's wish. Things called for on objective cards can only be counted once across all your objectives. If you have multiple cards calling for green TPs, for example, you would need to collect a green TP for each card calling for one, not use the same TP over and over. Apart from the starting objectives, any objective card you play but aren't able to complete by the end of the game will be worth negative victory points. Player decks represent the cattle in your herd. Each player starts with an identical deck of starter steers, marked with sheriff stars in their color. These cattle aren't very good, but they can be spent at various buildings along the trail to get money you need to improve. The other steers are shuffled into a deck that is used to populate the cattle market at the start of the game and repopulate it at two additional times during the game. Great Western Trail has three sets of small numbered tiles. These should all be shuffled into individual piles by their number. They are then drawn at random to populate parts of the board at setup and into the foresight spots in Kansas City over the course of the game. Number one tiles are always either hazard or TP tiles. Number two tiles are always employee tiles. And number three tiles are a blend of job and hazard or TP tiles. Employee tiles indicate a type of worker available for hire. When they're selected from the foresight spots, they come down into the job market. The cost of hiring them is determined by their row, but can also be modified up or down by the specific action being used to hire them. Now let's talk about hazard tiles. There are five types of hazards, denoted by black or green hand symbols, that can be placed on the trail during the game. When moving your player piece through a hazard, it counts as one of your movement points, but will also deduct a set number of dollars from you depending on the color of the hand and the player count. You must pay the money for a hazard if you are able, or as much of it as you can. However, and this is very important, if you do not have the money to pay, you move past the hazard using the movement point but you don't take any financial penalty. Hazard tiles can be removed from the board by taking a special action at certain buildings. When you remove a hazard, you take the tile. Most of them have point values that will be counted in your favor at the end of the game. Hazard tiles also count as a building if you choose to or have to stop on them, at which point you can take one of your auxiliary actions. The flood, drought, and rockfall hazards 
differ in where they are placed upon the board when drawn. TP tiles do not have an inherent point value themselves, but can be worth points at the end of the game through a Station Master tile, and are also important in completing many objective cards. One of the higher level private buildings also allows you to use them to great effect. The last type of hazard tile is private buildings, which I'll discuss in a moment. Building tiles are locations on the trail. Moving to or through each one counts as one movement. Great Western Trail has two kinds of building tiles, gray neutral buildings and player colored private buildings. The actions on neutral buildings can be used by all players. Stopping on a building allows you to take the two actions depicted or forego those actions to take one of the auxiliary actions printed on your player boards. Actions on private buildings can only be used by their owners. However, anyone can stop at a private building to take a plain auxiliary action. There are seven neutral buildings that will be used in every game. There is an arrangement printed on the board for use in your first game, but they are distributed randomly in subsequent plays. Each player gets a set of the same 10 private building tiles in their color. Each of the 10 buildings in the set is unique, with buildings getting more powerful as they require more and more craftsmen to construct. Private buildings each have an A side and a B side. For your first few games, it is recommended that everyone play with all A sides. After that, you can have one player randomly determine which blend of A's and B's they will be playing with, and then have everyone else flip their tiles to match. All players should always play with the same composition in their private building supply as everyone else. Some private buildings have the black or green hand symbols that denote a hazard. When these buildings are put on the board, they not only act as a helpful stop for their owner, but as an unremovable hazard for other players. Like passing a neutral hazard, players must pay the listed amounts on their player board when passing a private building with a hand symbol. However, instead of the spent funds going to the bank, they instead go to the building's owner. There are two additional things to keep in mind when placing private buildings. Some spots have additional actions printed below the building slot. When you go to a building in that slot, you can choose to take that action in addition to what the building allows. Many building slots overlap forest. This is important because the lowest level building in each player's supply has a single action that awards more money depending on how many other buildings you have covering portions of forest. One last important rule associated with buildings. Whenever taking actions, you can choose to forego some or all of the benefits. For example, this action says that I can discard a Jersey Steer to gain a certificate and $2. But if I was maxed out on certificates, I could still take the $2. Here's how you set up a game of Great Western Trail. Players are all given a set of pieces and herd cards in their color, as well as randomly selected starting objectives and starting money depending on their player order. If more than two people are playing, players then put their player count tile on the spot denoting hazard tile, passage, and movement. Players cover all indicated spots on their player board with their wooden discs and set their certificates cube to zero. They place their engine token at the Red House in Kansas City at the start of the rail line. They shuffle their personal cattle deck and draw a hand of four cards. In the first round of the game, instead of starting at the beginning of the trail, you actually choose any of the neutral buildings you want to start your cattleman token on. And instead of moving that turn, you'll simply take the actions associated with that building. The cattle market deck is shuffled, and a number of cards determined by the player count is dealt face up below the board in the cattle market slot. The cattle market will be automatically refilled to this same level twice during the game as the job market token passes this symbol. Beyond that, it can only have additional cards added by players spending extra cowboys. The objective deck is shuffled, and the top four cards are turned up in a display. When players take objective cards over the course of the game, new cards will immediately be dealt to take their place. Here's how you set up the board. Seven hazard tiles are drawn at random from the one tile pile, and placed in their designated places on the board, filling the lower number of spots first. The first row of the job market is filled at random from the number two tiles pile. 
The neutral buildings are placed in their slots, either at random or in accordance with the letters printed on the board. The station master tiles are shuffled and placed in the stations along the top of the board. The six foresight spots in Kansas City are filled with face-up tiles from their respective piles. Turns in Great Western Trail are very simple. On their turn, a player decides how many spaces along the trail they want to move. Their initial maximum movement points are determined by the player count, but can also be upgraded over the course of the game by making cattle deliveries. As they move, they pay for any hazards they pass through, and then they undertake actions where they stop. Whenever the trail splits, they choose which branch they will take. If players have one or more objective cards in their hand, they can choose to play them for the bonus actions before or after taking their move and doing those building actions. When a player plays an objective card for its action, it comes out of their deck and becomes part of their tableau. At this point, they are committed to completing it by the end of the game or suffering the negative point penalty. At the end of their turn, if they are below their hand limit, they draw cards to meet it. If there are not enough cards to draw in their deck, they shuffle their discard pile, and that becomes their new deck for drawing the remaining and future cards. Let's talk about auxiliary actions. Along the left side of the player board, there are several auxiliary actions. These can be taken instead of main actions, or in some cases as part of taking main actions. They allow you to take money, draw and discard cards, manipulate the positioning of your engine, and more. Most auxiliary actions need to be unlocked first by removing discs from them. When you do an auxiliary action at someone else's building or a hazard, you only get to take it once. If you take it as part of this neutral building action and you've unlocked its second slot, you can do it twice. There are several actions on private buildings and neutral buildings. Here's a breakdown of the most important ones. Hiring employees. The hiring action looks like this. Employees' price is determined by their placement in the job market and then modified by any pluses or minuses printed on the action space. When a player places a new employee on their board, if they cover up an action on the board, that player may take that action immediately. If a player removes an employee from their board to put them on a station space, and then later covers that newly opened action again with a new employee, they can take the same action again. The engine movement action looks like this. The distance a player's engine moves on the track is determined by their number of engineers. Note that all players start with one. There's one very important rule when it comes to moving engines. Apart from the starting spot in the red house, no spot on the rail line can have more than one engine. That means that when you go to move your engine, if there's somebody in the next space you would move to, you instead leapfrog them for that movement. This enables you to draft your engine with other people's engines and can really penalize you if you're left behind the pack. Players may, if they want, choose to forego some or all of this movement if they wish, which they would typically do to land at one of the side stations. If an engine reaches a switch, the player can choose for its next movement to take place on the lower fork or the upper fork. If they take the lower fork, they can then interact with the station there. When interacting with a station, players can do two things. First, they can make a special delivery to upgrade the station. The player plays a cost in dollars next to the station and puts one of their discs on that station. Discs from black cornered spots can only be put on stations with black cornered spots. This unlocks a space on their board, just like delivering cattle to a city. At the end of the game, they will also get the number of points depicted on the board next to that station. Like most cities, each player can only deliver to a given station once. For the stations along the top of the board, there is then a second action they can take after placing their disc. At the beginning of the game, these stations are randomly seated with station master tiles. These provide the player who takes them with alternate ways of scoring points and typically an immediate benefit like money or permanent certificate that can be used to augment their cattle sales over and over. Taking a station master tile can be done after upgrading a station. It's as simple as exchanging one of the employee tiles on your board, any that you want, as long as it's the rightmost one in the row, for the station tile. 
Once they go into that station, they're going to stay there for the rest of the game. The buying cattle action looks like this. Players can buy cards from the cattle market below the board. The number and quality of cattle they can buy, and the prices they pay for them, are determined by the number of cowboys they employ. This part's a little tricky to explain. Cowboys are spent to make purchases. They don't actually leave your board, you don't get rid of them, but you can only use each cowboy once per trip to the cattle market. There are many variations of the cattle purchasing action printed along the bottom of the board, and you can make multiple purchases or purchases at better prices depending on how you allocate the use of your cowboys for that particular trip. In addition to actually buying cattle, you can use one of your cowboys or multiples of your cowboys to add two cards to the cattle market from the top of the cattle deck for each cowboy you use in this way. Purchased cattle cards go into their owner's discard pile to be shuffled into the main body of their deck once they run out of cards to draw. The building action looks like this. Players may build one of their private buildings on the trail. The level of building they can build is determined by the number of craftsmen that they employ. The cost of the building is printed on the action and is typically determined by the level of building being built. In addition to building buildings on empty slots along the trail, players may instead build over one of their private buildings that's already on the trail. In this case, they only need to employ the number of laborers and spend the amount of money for the difference between the tile that's already down and the better tile that they're attempting to build on top of it. Once you build over a tile, the old tile is removed to the game box and is no longer available. This is what an exchange action looks like. There are several of these in the game, and basically what you're doing is discarding the depicted cattle to your discard pile and then collecting some sort of benefit, typically money. This is the taking a certificate or an objective action. The image depicting moving the cube downward is the taking a certificate choice. If you take a certificate, you advance the cube in your certificate section down, assuming there is space open. Note that the last step on the certificate track isn't a one certificate addition, but it's actually two. You go from four to six. This is what the taking an objective card side of the choice looks like. A player may pick the objective card of their choice from the display and put it in their discard pile to be later shuffled into their deck when they run out of cards to draw. When a player later draws an objective card into their hand, they may choose to play it to their tableau before or after taking their main action. This gives them the bonus action lifted in the top left of the card, but commits them to either completing the objective or paying the penalty points at the end of the game. Objective cards still in a player's deck at the end of the game can be counted or not counted towards their final total at the player's discretion. Here's Kansas City. When a player reaches Kansas City, they perform five tasks in order. Tasks one to three each involve selecting a tile from the foresight column and placing it in its designated spaces on the board. Hazard tiles go to their designated regions. Job tiles or employee tiles go into the market. As each job tile row is completed, it pushes the round job market token down to the row below it. Again, when the token is pushed off the edge of the board, it is time for the game to end. If the job token passes a steer symbol, cards are drawn from the cattle market deck to bring the market up to the number of cards indicated at the bottom of the board, unless it is already at or above that number. The tiles that are taken from the foresight display are then replaced with others drawn from their respective piles. Task four is to show their hand to the other players and calculate its breed value. The value of their hand is the sum of each unique card's breed value. Duplicate cards are not counted, so you want to have as many different breeds in your hand as possible, and preferably high quality breeds. Once the hand's value has been calculated, a player can choose to spend certificates to further increase its value. Once they know the total value of their herd with their certificates, they discard it and then collect money equal to that value. The last task is to keep that herd value in mind and then select a target city on the rail line to deliver those cattle to. The point of delivery must be no higher in value than the value of the herd and certificates that they've spent. For each crossing sign between their engine and the target city, 
they must pay a dollar in transit costs. Each city, with the exceptions of Kansas City and San Francisco, can only be delivered to once by each player. Once they've selected their city and paid the money, they mark the delivery by removing one of their discs from their player mat, thereby unlocking a new auxiliary action, improving an existing one, increasing their movement, or increasing their hand size, and placing it on the rail line. Discs from black slots on the player mat, which are much more powerful, can only be delivered to black framed cities or stations. Discs from white slots can be delivered to either white or black cities or stations. Removing discs from the movement section of the player board will also provide the player with money or victory points. Removing discs from the hand size section of the player board will actually cost the player money that must be paid before the disc can be removed. Delivering discs to paired cities, which are designated with a pair of green arrows, may allow bonus actions or add or subtract from a player's score at the end of the game. Delivering to Kansas City will provide you money now, but cost you six victory points at the end of the game. Think of it as a loan. After completing all the Kansas City tasks, the player moves their cattleman piece back down to the beginning of the trail and draws up to their hand limit. Play continues in this way until the job token leaves the bottom of the job market. As I said, at that point, every other player gets to take one final turn, and then the points are counted up. At the end of the game, players count up victory points displayed on cards in their deck, objectives on the table, claimed deliveries and stations, station master tiles, hazard tiles, buildings they own on the board, and the job market token, if they took it. If there are objectives in their deck that they did not play for bonus actions during the game, they can choose whether or not to count those towards their total. Money is added to that total in a ratio of one point per five dollars. That's it, you now know how to play Great Western Trail. Enjoy! If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to my channel. It would be great if you gave it a thumbs up so it was easier for other people to find. And you can also check out our podcast, Dice and Dachshunds, on Podbean, iTunes, or BoardGameGeek. Thanks for watching.